Cyber Frontier, bringing you the latest news on the local Colorado economy and initiatives that focus on the development of cybersecurity economics. You don't have to be a computer or cybersecurity expert to get plugged in. Your host, Chris Gorog, brings it straightforward, asks the tough questions, and brings the cyber world to a level of understanding for everyone. Chris is personable and opens up with our guests on issues we all would like to see addressed. You can find us on the web at www.newcyberfrontier.com. Now join our host as he introduces the topic for today's New Cyber Frontier. So welcome to today's episode of New Cyber Frontier. Uh, this is a part two where we are talking to William Blake, Bill Blake, he likes to yep. go by Bill. Um, and we, in the last show, had got to kind of the early 2000s, talking about his progression uh, and uh, the through security of communications and uh, just thought that there was too much to keep going. So we were bringing everybody back to have a part two here. So if we then give us a, re a two minute recap on where we were for the first part. So the first part we went through from a commercial bank into the United States Air early Force. Early 70s, we're early, talking. Early 70s into the uh, United States Air Force from uh, 77 through 1998, mm -hmm. 90, in the 90s we went into distributed computing. So we in did the in the mid 90s. In the mid 90s we started getting into distributed computing. We started bringing in networking. Uh, networking really hit heavy in the late 90s, mm -hmm. uh, and then we got into the 2000s, and everything just was. And the first kind of viruses is started, where we we started getting the viruses in the, yeah. in the late 90s. We started getting those in the late 90s, and it was, that was that was fun times. So now let's go back to that first viruses and tell us what what people thought when this came out. What was the feeling about this? Was it like, oh, wow, we didn't think about this? Or, oh yeah, that was funny? Or what was the kind of... It was all over the board. It really yeah. was. So you had some folks that thought, hey, that was cute. I wonder if I can do that. <laughs> and you had other folks thinking, oh crap, how did they do that? And maybe we need to fix some things. And but if you look back, if, if you go way back, we were told this kind of thing was going to happen. Uh huh. In the you look at the wear report, report. You said back yeah. in the wear report from 1970, we were told these kinds of things were going to happen. We needed to account for them. We needed to build secure. We needed to have certifications on our systems. We need to certify our systems, certify our software. Mm -hmm. We're still telling folks to do that. Are they? I mean, it's we don't. The, we are, we, the larger IT community, we're mm -hmm. notorious for every time we see a problem, we think we're the first person to see it, and therefore we need to come up with the first solution. Instead mm -hmm. of going back and saying, hey, has this problem occurred before, and what did they do about it? Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, the, currently there's uh, a couple images going around of the cybersecurity landscape. If you haven't seen this, search for it. There's literally like a thousand icons of products on one yeah. image and they're like okay just buy buy these products and you'll be secure yeah no <laughs> yeah, we prove we've proven that time and time again that because doesn't work everybody finds a problem it's a new problem they go make a new solution for it solution. and a new company and they sell it so back in the late 70s i was a programmer trainee mm -hmm. so as a programmer trainee one of the first things they write they have you code is a sort routine how many sort routines do we need? It's kind of like doing math, though. You got to learn how to do the problems so you can. Yeah. Yeah. But we learn wrong. Should we learn where the sort routine is? I agree. And that nowadays, the the teaching is. I do it differently nowadays. It's like so many things are out there. Let's not reinvent them. Yes. I want to teach you to index and find a hundred different things that you can use. Yes. Instead of learn the two that everybody else learned for so 10 years. So now let's talk the downfall of that. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> right. The, the downfall, downfall to everything, right? The downfall of that is if the guy that wrote the routine that you're calling didn't code it right and it's got a flaw in it, uh -huh. how many other people are, do, are calling that same routine with that same flaw? And don't even know they're using it. Nobody does, right? Yeah. Nobody knows the flaws there. So as an attacker, if I find the flaw, I have a rich environment to now exploit. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. So we were talking about, though, the first viruses, how people fought, felt about them. 
Do you remember the first person that came out and said, I have a solution for that, viruses won't catch anymore because here's a product? It, oh yeah, we started getting antivirus stuff. That was, so, and that what was, did you yeah, think about that? When that, that came like, out, was that like, it's like, wow, it's all solved, problem's it's, gone. No, no, we knew it wasn't. It was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so how is he going to fix the, oh, he's going to look for that virus. So all I have to do is modify that virus and he doesn't see it anymore because all the original virus scanners were signature based. But that was the people that knew that they had to get into that. Course. There was probably, so many people were like, wow, what problem's gone. Problem's gone. Really? Turn the page. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> It, it depended on which company you went into, what their culture was. Uh -huh. um, it depended really on the industry. Bankers, insurance companies, they were pretty smart. They knew risk. They went, that's not gonna really work, is it? And we're like, yeah, no, it's not really gonna work. You need to do it, but it's. Yeah, but you need to be careful also. Yeah. They got it. Yeah. Of course, they didn't have enough money and they couldn't get enough, you know, you, you, there's never enough money. Yeah. Let's talk about that in a minute. Let me hear from our sponsors. Be right back. We'll be right back with the rest of today's show right after these brief messages from our sponsors. Cyber Resilience Institute helps build strong cyber communities designed to prevent members from attack. Like building a neighborhood watch, it takes coordination and a sharing community to protect our identities and valuables in the virtual world. Typically, we hear that organizations know they need to do something to protect their cyber assets, but don't know where to begin. Let Cyber Resilience Institute help your community create an action plan. Cyber Resilience Institute will build your community or business marketplace so that it is designed to support a collective cyber defense. Contact them for more information at cyberresilienceinstitute.org. All right, welcome back. We're talking to Bill Blake about uh, kind of the progression of communication security. Um, yeah, I want to take things back. I want to talk communications. Okay. Okay. Well, I was going to ask you one thing about what we sure. were talking about right before Let, the break. Let's go for that first. Um, they never had enough money, right? Nobody does. Yeah. So that, that these very technical people that are smart mm -hmm. that ask the management for, I need this money to do this. Right. And they give them a, a two page explanation of what they need to do, and they look at it and go, is that in Greek, English, or yeah, Italian? Yeah. What, what oh, language God. is that written in? It is, again, it depended. Okay, Schneier, oh, thank God for Bruce Schneier. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I read his books and, and, and thought through where he was going and said, oh, okay, what we really need to do is we need to talk to these people in their language. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, if I'm going into a company, when I was with IBM, we usually went in on the IT side. So we, we were talking to the technology guys. But I, as a, as a security architect, were trying to help design their enterprise security architecture. I'd say, we need to talk to the business people because they're the ones that really are the, the guys that are impacted. So we got to go talk to those guys. And you have to talk to the business guys in their languages. Mm -hmm. You have to know what their data is. You have to know what their concerns are. You have to know what's important to them. And if you can put it in their language and then tie it back into how the IT stuff has to play with it, now you can get a sell. Mm -hmm. Now they're, now they're going to get buy-in for it because they understand what you're talking about. You're talk These are guys that make risk-based decisions all the time, mm -hmm. right? I mean, do I put my next plant, where do I put my next plant? Do I put it someplace where guys with guns are going to attack me? Probably not. Do I put it someplace where I don't have good cash flow or or that kind of stuff? Probably not. So I gotta, they, these are the guys that make those kinds of decisions all the time. Mm -hmm. You just have to put the risks they're facing in the cyber world into terms they understand. Mm -hmm. Document the risk for them and they'll make the decision. You may not agree with their decision. Doesn't matter, they made the decision. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, there's always that gap, and I always ask anybody that brings it up, how you know how do we how do we bridge it because it, it, it's been it, difficult. And we have screwed that up from the beginning. But again, mm -hmm. if you go back, Schneier wrote about that in the early 2000s. Marcus Ranum, he's written about it a number of times. Mm -hmm. uh, last time when I saw from him was 2009. A lot of what we do here, this the attempt is. That's the can attempt. we get anybody to anybody to be able to understand what we're talking about? not just the very technical yeah, and, people. And you can't put it in a techie talk, you cannot. You mm -hmm. have to bring it down in, okay, 
this is your data. Your data is, is all of this information about your clients. Okay. Now, you know, what are your clients concerned about? Are they concerned about where that data goes? Who has that data? Are there any, raw, any laws like HIPAA mm -hmm. that, that impact what you can do and can't do with that data? Yeah. All those things. My funnest one. Oh, God. I was at an insurance company. <laughs> and we had the marketing guys in the room. Mm -hmm. and we had the lawyers in the room. Marketing guys didn't know the lawyers were in the room, which was interesting. They didn't know who the lawyers were. Okay, so we're talking, well, all right, well, you have this data, and this data needs to be protected. And the marketing guy goes, no, it doesn't. And the lawyer went, what? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean it doesn't need to be protected? Well, this is what we're going to do with yada, yada. The lawyer guys, did you know you just got us fined a couple hundred million dollars and this guy sent to jail? And the marketing guy went, what? Uh, yeah, the marketing guys didn't know what the laws were. They had never uh -huh. talked to the lawyers. So we, the best thing we did there was put the lawyers and the marketing guys in the same together room. talking about the data. Yeah, so if you could have those kinds of conversations, not about, well, I need a firewall here and I need an information protection system there and I need a information security management, what a what a, you know, I, I, don't even talk about that stuff. Mm -hmm. Talk about the data. It's all about the data. Hmm. Now, and I think this might be a little different direction. Let's take a little sidebar here. All about the data. I hear that so often. My background, before I even got to looking at information security, I spent quite a few years in design engineering. Okay. Uh, designing hardware, embedded systems. So those small little devices like in your phone that just do a single right. purpose right. or in your VCR, right. TV. There's millions of them out there, right? Yep. Um, and working with utility systems. The Internet of Things, they call it now. Yep. And for the most part, our designs included two machines that would talk to each other for 10 years, a human would never be involved, and they would tell a million times over 10 years, on, off, on, off, on, off. Yep. There was no value to the data at all. But what was important, I mean, this whole industry that I had never got into information security until after I spent right. 10 years in this, this whole industry didn't care about data because of that, because data was just commands. Okay, but now, so now you got to talk to them not about the data, you got to talk about, about the command. Okay, what functions are being performed over here? Your job is to push electricity around the country, mm -hmm. or your job is to push uh, ones and zeros over satellites, or, or whatever. And, and you got to bring it down to what it is they do. Exactly. Because every that's business what they know. has such a different need, every industry yes. will say, yeah. for security, that that whole industry didn't think about information security. They looked at it in terms yeah. of what something that information security doesn't look at is trust. Because those pieces of equipment had to operate things in the real physical world and turn on a breaker in your backyard or open a gas valve yeah. in your backyard or, or a dam down the road that could flood your house. We needed to know a different paradigm about the data and it wasn't that we could keep the data and manage the data it was that we could trust that command came from the right person. It, you're actually starting to get into an old communication theory stuff on traffic analysis. Okay. All right, so now if I want to know how your company works, I'm a bad guy. I'm uh -huh. starting to look at your data flows. Okay. okay. I'm starting to look at how you how you operate stuff. If I look at this line and I say this pulse goes through and this happens and then this pulse goes through and this happens by just doing basic traffic analysis. I can start saying, okay, this pulse does this. If I interrupt that pulse, it won't do that. If I send that pulse at the wrong time, it'll do it out of cycle. Mm -hmm. So through a little traffic analysis, I can screw with you. Mm -hmm. Okay. How long have we known about traffic analysis? Well, I mean, that those were, we didn't call it traffic analysis because it was a more no, of a you didn't. communications, those were timing attacks, So the communications attacks. guys would have called that traffic analysis, the intel guys would have called it that, in the 40s. Mm -hmm. So we've known about that kind of thing since the 40s. When we designed the first online encryption, mm -hmm. okay, so I'm, I'm talking doing data transfer or I'm doing voice or whatever it was, from from Fort A 
to outpost B, mm -hmm. my crypto equipment had a constant tone on the line. Tone on the line. Yeah, it, const it was constantly sending data. Constant, 100% okay. of the time. So that you couldn't tell when? When real data was going. Real data or false data. Just yeah, it was, there, was a constant, there was a constant data stream, constant tone on the line, 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. And then when I inject real data into it, it didn't look any different. And in the structured communication world for machine-to-machine yeah. -machine communications, we still yeah. use that. Yeah. It's not asynchronous, which is that we send information when we need to, we get it when it responds. Okay. That's more the user with people attached, yeah. their operations with data, follow that pattern. So it's just where on the stack you're putting the data and what it is, and mm -hmm. the system on the other end needs to know what's real and what's not. Mm -hmm. and it's magic. <laughs> magic. So we're, we went sidebar there. So uh, first of all, I'll take a break here from our sponsors. We'll be right back in a minute. We'll be right back with the rest of today's show right after these brief messages from our sponsors. Over 3 million data breaches happen every single day. That's over 2,000 records being compromised every minute. So often, we focus on securing web data access. But what if the attackers are already inside, having gained direct access to your storage through data management software? When it comes to communications that go directly into your storage devices, make SNIA your first line of protection. SNIA's conformance testing limits outdated communications that are known to be used by attackers. It works continuously behind the background to make sure your storage is protected. To find out if your data is truly secure, visit our website at www.snia.org forward slash cyber test. All right, welcome back. We're talking to Bill Blake again, uh, still about kind of the progression of well, communication uh, security. Yeah, so. well, I want to talk. So as a communications guy, uh, I learned a term, MIGI. Meekening, intrusion, jamming, and interference. Okay. Okay. That was a term that was developed in the 40s, 50s time frame. Mm -hmm. um, came out of World War II. Okay. All right. So we were doing a lot of radio in World War II. Mm -hmm. Okay. In order, to, the code talkers, everybody's heard about the code talkers. We, we used Navajo. We sent Navajo speakers out to various places in, in, in the, mostly in the Pacific. And they would speak Navajo to each other mm -hmm. over the radio lines because nobody could break Navajo. If you didn't speak it, there was no breaking it. It just wasn't going to happen. Because so, we figured out that the Japanese were listening in on our radio. And mm -hmm. we were listening in on theirs. And you just put a native speaker in the hey, we can hear what they're doing, come with their plans. So we figured we needed to do something. Uh, so as a result of that, we came up with encryption. Okay, to address that. So that's that is the that addresses the um, intrusion portion of it. We'd also get, you would get on the lines during World War II and even into partial in Korea, you would get somebody come onto your radio and tell you to do something. And it wasn't the guy that was really talking to you, it was an enemy. And he's telling you to go someplace where he wants you so he can get you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's intrusion. And we knew about that and we've been addressing that. So you address that with code words, you address that with code talkers, you address that with, with challenge response. Yeah, I mean, this this is so military-centric, though. Now let's go over to, well, how does this apply to... Did I unplug something? <laughs> God, I hope not. Um, so it, let's bring that in. Yeah. Um, if you could pick that up and just set it on the table. I'll pick a piece of equipment up that I knocked down. There we go. So let me finish with the with, with what with these the are. Now. Okay. Okay, so meekening, mm -hmm. that's a really cool one. Meekening is, I'm going to futz with the navigation. Mm-hmm. I want you to navigate someplace where you don't want to be. Do you remember the Iranians brought down a secure drone here a number of years ago? I do remember. They did that by broadcasting false GPS signals. Mm -hmm. So the drone thought it was higher than it was. So it lowered its altitude to get down to the altitude it was supposed to be operating at, and that was the desert floor and it impacted the desert floor. Mm -hmm. So that's a making attack. So meekening's been around actually since about the 1400s. Mm -hmm. Fires on the shore, you all heard about that? Mm -hmm. Turns out that's a myth. 
But they did, in off the coast of Ireland and the coast of Scotland, they used to put lights on donkeys hmm. and walk them back and forth in an area so it looked like ships moving in on. a harbor. So yeah, if you're coming in from the Americas and you're looking for a safe harbor because it's dark, oh, there's some ships over here in this harbor, I'm gonna sail into that and you sail into the rocks and they, and they get your cargo. Hmm. So 1400s, mm -hmm. weakening. All right, so jamming, I don't want you to be able to use your radios. So I'm just gonna broadcast signal at a higher power than, you, than you're broadcasting at and I'm gonna walk all over your signal so you can't use your radios. Mm -hmm. Okay, interference is, actually interference is um, something that screws with your, with your transmissions, but it's not intentional. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, that's your meeting, meeting, intrusion, jamming, interference. Jamming, directed denial of service. Why do we call it DDoS? Why don't we call it jamming? We've known how to fix jamming for a long time. Mm -hmm. Somebody jams one of our satellites, you just shut the spot beam off until you can put a kinetic solution on the problem. Kinetic. Yeah, drop a bomb on them. <laughs> yeah. Military guys. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna have a kinetic solution for that problem. All right, you gotta blow it up, but we get that. <laughs> but you just turn the spot beam off. And now they're, they're wasting power shooting at your satellite and nothing's going. They're mm -hmm. just ignoring it. Hmm. Um, meekening. Meekening is a spoofed email that says, hey, click on this site to go to Google and enter your password into Gmail. And you're not at Google, you're not at Gmail. Mm -hmm. But now we call it spoofing, we call it phishing, we call it, it's meekening is what it is. And so, we know yeah, solutions for these, that too. All these, you know, in the 40s, these concepts were designed. Yeah. They do relate directly over, but we haven't got that adoption to happen. And we talked earlier about risk offset, right? So I think, you know, from what I've heard, you know, the risk manager said, okay, I wouldn't build in a place where there's a, a hurricane all the time, but you know, the chances of a tornado hitting this one spot are low, so I'll build there. You know, but, but the risk management aspect, when they look at these things and said, okay, did we spend all this time designing some security feature in? Mm -hmm or do we accept that risk? That is still happening to where the business decision is to accept the cyber risk. When does that become painful enough, I guess is, is my question. Well, I, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, is we screwed up when we renamed things. Because we renamed things, we've lost all this history. If we had all that history. But if we don't know, like I didn't know the history of these, I wouldn't have known those concepts. But if you so had, but if we I'm hadn't one of the renamers. But if we hadn't renamed them, then you'd be able to go back and look at it and see, oh, this goes all the way back to this. And now I have a better conversation to have with the business. Yeah. Now I can go back decades and say, hey, this is stuff's been around a long time. Here's how bad guys exploit it. And here's how we would, what things we've done to prevent the exploitation, to address mm -hmm. the exploitation, to, to get those things to happen. Now I've got decades of experience behind me as I go have these conversations, as I, as I design solutions instead yeah. of, what, the 15, 20, 30 years? Okay. You know though, when, when I look at that, the same thing, and, and technology, when new stuff comes around, sometimes it's different enough that even the old terminology doesn't really fit the picture. And I'll give you an example. We were just in my class last night going through the progression of privacy versus exp reasonable expectation of right. privacy right. versus what's open right. public. Right. And, U.S. mail correlated to phone for a couple years back in the early 1900s, and then phone correlated to email, correlated to web, but not very well. There are so many changes at those points when the new technology come in that we can't say web is an equivalent but the to bad voice. Guys, but the bad guys don't see it that way. Yes, you can you can look at the exploits the same way, let's, let's, but the solution for solving it the Nigerian is going to be scam. different. You know the Nigerian scam? I'm a Nigerian prince. I need help. Mm -hmm. Send me your, you know, send me your, uh, and, and I'll reward you handsomely. How long has that been around? It's like the 1400s, right? 1800s. 1800s. Spanish prisoner scam. Yeah. We changed the name again, but yeah, it's a Spanish prisoner. It's been around since the 1800s. The scammers, they run the same scams. They're just doing it with the new technology. They've adapted. They've adapted. Absolutely. Why didn't we? We can make the same adaptations they can. We're just thinking. You're thinking at the lower level. Well, I think Bring we go back to that, that the risk is 
it's too, it's too small to spend the money to do it. it, it well, is it? <laughs> and that's the same. Is it? Is the pain enough now that we have all these yeah. attacks and everything in the news that we're changing that? I mean, literally. But I'm thinking we we were talking about early 2000s when the let's when, go, let's when, go back to that. Well, yeah, when yeah. when this, the the um, viruses and stuff started showing up, and to current now we're talking current. Yeah. And I think we've been in the same dilemma ever since then. So in the early 2000s, the difference is in the early 2000s. The phrase we would use, yeah, they're never going to do this because a CEO has never been fired for security. Mm -hmm. That changed. It's still, Target. It's still, Target's the first and only one, I think, right? No, uh, there's been a couple since. Has there been a couple since? Yeah. I mean, but it's still minimal risk, right? Look at Equifax. Yeah, that's probably oh going to get, get some big. <laughs> Nobody lost their job. Hmm. Their, their stock price went back up. It went back up. I was like, oh my God, you got to be kidding. So are we just getting a stomach for it now? I, I hope I hope that we're finally they're finally paying attention. I mean, you are seeing uh, boards of something you just said. Who is the they? That's always the, yeah. Who is the they? Yeah, I I, <laughs> I I ask that anytime somebody says yes, they'll do it. They need to do it. Who is the they? I was at Squire and Officer School, and this this general comes walking in. And he goes, okay. You all wanted to know. I know the three things you always wanted to know. You always wanted to know who was the regular crew chief. All the pilots out there will get that. The pilot goes to the plane while this broke. Who's, where's the crew chief? Well, I'm not the regular crew chief, sir. <laughs> so I always want to meet the regular crew chief. I always want to see the big picture. And I always want to know who they are. He says, anybody says, who are they? I'm they. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, that's the problem so right now. I hear everybody saying, this needs to happen. They need to do that. This problem needs to be solved. But that they person is not he defined. He ain't there. He ain't finding him. Yeah. Um, what we are seeing, what we were seeing before I, re I retired out of IBM a couple of years ago, what we were starting to see is the board of directors were starting to put in the contracts for the C level officers' mm -hmm. concerns over security. So when the board of directors of major corporations start doing that, now now you got something. And this is happening so slow, though. I mean, well. Like I said, <laughs> the Ware Report was written in 1970. The huh. Cuckoo's Egg came out in the late 90s. R read that. I knew some of the, some of the guys who I, mentioned I'll that. I'll have I, to take, I, a, I take a mention of that. Um, but it still seems like that we've been in the same paradox since that since buyers has come out, yeah. since threats came changed. around, that we haven't... Yeah, why is that? I don't know. That's what I'm asking you. You've we been around for it. a bigger... We don't teach it. Don't teach it. We don't teach it. What do we have to teach and who's learning? We need to, well, that's a good question. Um, we need to teach some basic things around IT security in every IT class, at every, every cyber class, whatever. Why did we change the goddamn name again? <laughs> anyway, every, every. I think that's a first on my show. <laughs> <laughs> we keep changing the names and it pisses me off. Um, we need to teach basic security stuff from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this concept of, I got a couple guys out of high school that learned how to program in C, and they think they can write some really good code, and they're cheap, and I'm going to bring them in to write my code. Whoever does that should be fired. But you know what? And <laughs> Fired. I did this for, for a company for a while. My job was to outsource, and we were hiring four to one people yeah. in another country to commoditize yeah. that code development. Yeah. So this is not just a U.S. thing. This is international. When, when we say they, we mean the, the international community of IT professionals. I think we're misclassifying the they. The they is the people that are trying to save money. <laughs> because any place where security or the next the need for making this better comes in, there's a dollar figure with it, yeah. and that is offset against somebody with the they decision. Yeah, so you have to show them, okay, these are business people. They know how to make risk-based decisions. This is the risk. Here's what the cost of that risk is, and I have to be able to put in cost. Yeah. If I can do that. And I you know what we're doing with blockchain, and uh, yeah. is we're making the, not just the risk um, mitigation, not just the deference of risk, but here is a way to make money off of selling security transactions in the future. Yeah. Changes the way we look at it. Yeah. I think that's gonna be the first, and this is why blockchain is so big, that's gonna be the first 
way that we can change that conversation around money with security to you buy the security so you don't have the possible you know, possible problem happening, right. or you buy the security to make a transaction to sell security. It changes the game, and that's what blockchain's bringing us. Yeah, it's it's bringing traceability. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the first big one. Walmart teamed with IBM to track, um, I think it was strawberries or tomatoes, from the field to the store. Mm -hmm. So now the, the buyer in the store the consumer can look and see exactly when the, that product was picked out of the field and what field it came from, mm -hmm. with some assurance that that's actually true. And there's a big push a couple shows ago. I did a, a show with the state senator from Colorado, right. and Colorado is looking at doing that governance for several programs in the state. It's going to be a game changer. Cool. Yeah. I mean, this. If we can finally get to the point where we can put um, responsibility, accountability. Accountability. If we can put that in the C-suite, now we now we can have we can have an impact. Mm -hmm. But we've been trying to do it in in well since the '90s, since the late '90s, we've been trying really hard to do that. Yeah, and we've not been having a lot of success. So hopefully, I don't know if blockchain is going to be it. I think, I mean, we, we said even Schneier said, and I think it was one of his books in 2005, said, okay, if we all just talk like this, we'll be we'll be good. All right, <laughs> 12 years ago, mm -hmm. and we're still not talking like that. So. Yeah, you know, one of his, the, the quote I liked the best from a book, the books I've read of his was that all technology is morally agnostic. Yeah. Meaning everything we've ever invented thinking it's gonna solve a problem is used by the bad guys and the good guys the same, same. and it makes a new problem if it solves an old one. Yep. So, yeah, I think, and that's what, when I, I try to be, that's my cautionary tone about blockchain even, is you know, we're gonna make a new technology, we're gonna make a new visibility, a new accountability, a new traceability, but you know, there's gonna be some, there's gonna be well, some changes where there's gonna be some I, negative I, uses of that. Um, I just we read can't this, think of them all right now. I just read this morning, so um, Bitcoin. Bitcoin mm -hmm. was the big thing for, for bad guys to use to, uh, um, to cash out. Mm -hmm. Okay, ransomware went through Bitcoin. Well, money now, laundering. Now Bitcoin's a little more traceable, so mm -hmm. I can trace things on Bitcoin. Well, there's another coin that's out. Uh, I don't. It's with an M. I don't remember which one it was. It's made for non-traceability. Yeah, it, it's, it's part of its part of its deal is you can't trace it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there and will always what? be that cat and mouse game. And it's in the last three months, its value has gone up more than Bitcoin's value did. Now it's, it's I think it's at $749 a, a coin now where it was it's a, like a That's buck. not the Ethereum, is it? No, that's no. not Ethereum. It's, it's with it's a, I thought, it's more I don't remember than, there won't be another yeah. one that, that much. Yeah, that the, well, there's, there's, there's dog, dog, dog coin. <laughs> and there's over 1,300. I know, there's 1,350 insane. some it's last insane. time I looked. <laughs> and you know, some people made a new one since then, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure, it's just, it's just <laughs> insane stuff, so yeah. But I think, I think here's the promise, and I want you know. Let's talk about this. We got to kind of wrap up here. Yeah, we're gonna wrap up. But I think the promise with blockchain is that we connect the the virtual world with the physical world. We connect that accountability, and we make the ability for these things that we learned since the '40s to now transpire into the virtual world we instead of being disconnected. We can hope. We can hope. That, that's, that's probably all we've got. as good as we can that's get. That's all we've got. That's as good as it gets. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very oh, much. Thank you. I appreciate it. And we'll definitely bring you back on for some more uh, insight later. I, I'm right. always happy. As, as You're not the only presenter that I've, I've uh, crucified. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of known for that in the chapter. Uh, I, I definitely uh, enjoyed your questions, and I hope I... Uh, I gave you at least something to think about with them all, whether it you was did. good, bad, ugly, oh, yeah, we got something it, yeah. to think about. Yeah. It was fun. All right, thanks a lot for coming. All the work. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Bye. The views or opinions expressed during this podcast are not those of Colorado Technical University. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of New Cyber Frontier. Remember to get involved. Often we think that someone else will handle privacy and security in the virtual world, but you are the only one truly in command of your virtual fate. Join our mailing list so we can keep you informed of breaking news and new releases. 
If you have an idea, if you have a question that you would like to hear answered, or if you want to get involved with our efforts, reach out to us at newcyberfrontier.com. We also encourage you to visit our sponsors' links as they are the ones that really make this show possible. I want to thank each of you for supporting the show, and we look forward to seeing you back for the next episode of New Cyber Frontier.